similar environmental challenges, and that sometimes involve some of the same genes or, or even uh, alleles. Hybrid, homophobic hybrid speciation, that is, speciation catalyzed by hybridization without a change in chromosome number, as has happened in the late stage butterflies shown here, is a specifically interesting case to think about the repeatability of evolution as an opportunity to look at repeatability in a quantitative way across the genome. That's what I want to think about now, in the context of genome stabilization. Early in the hybrid speciation process, you can think of an in admixed individual genome as being composed of a series of large ancestry tracts. These are then broken up over time by recombination. Given limited gene flow, with a, a parental species, these will eventually shift in frequency due to both drift and selection, and the eventual outcome should be a genome that's stabilized in the sense that the ancestry blocks from either species are fixed at any given point in the genome. In cases of repeated or, or replicated hybrid speciation, you can look across different uh, outcomes of hybrid speciation to ask quantitatively how repeatable that outcome is. And that's what I want to think about in my study of butterflies. There's a series of admixed populations that occur in the alpine habitat along the spine of the Sierra Nevada White and Warner Mountain in Western North America, they're shown with the gray dots there. These are phenotypically distinct from the parental species, Lysiades anna, shown with black dots in the western slope of the Sierra, and Lysiades melissa, shown with white dots that the curves throughout the Great Basin. These populations uh, have a series of traits that are putatively adaptive in the alpine environment. This includes a strong preference for an alpine endemic host plant, as well as a sort of peculiar lack of aid adhesion. Although these populations are phenotypically similar, they have a complex and, and, and sort of variable history of admixtures as summarized by the population tree there. The admixed populations are within that box. All those red, orange, and yellow lines you no know, different hypothesized admixture events. The key here is that some are shared by most or all the populations, some are uh, just unique to a few populations. So we have a potentially sort of semi-independent origins of these species. This leads me to, so there's two questions that I want to think about today. One is how much progress has been made towards genome stabilization across these populations? And then how consistent has this uh, stabilization been in terms of the uh, admixture composition of those uh, block composition of those genomes? And the data I'm going to show you, the results I'm going to show you are based on a GPS data set of about a thousand individuals and using in, uh, are based on a model developed to look at ancestry frequencies while accounting for ancestry tracks within individuals and correlations and ancestry frequencies at the population level. So right now we're looking at ancestry frequencies for two sort of populations that are representative of the rest. These are specifically the Lysiades anna ancestry frequencies in those admixed populations. You're looking across the 22 autosome to the chromosome. Two things I want you to take home from this. One is there's lots of variation in ancestry frequencies across the genome, uh, such that the mean ancestry frequency for it is not very indicative of what you see in any specific point in the genome. The second is that only about 2% of the genome is fixed for anna or most ancestry. So the genome stabilization is, is far from complete. There's lots of segregating variation. In terms of consistency, I've made a plot here of the correlation and locus specific ancestry frequency between all pairs of, of you know, all 12 pairs of populations that I'm looking at. On average, there's moderate consistency in ancestry frequencies with a correlation of about 0.38. And as is shown on the sort of upper triangle of that plot there, it, it, there's a geographic component to it in the sense that nearby populations have more similar ancestry frequencies. If you look only at those uh, low side where you have exceptionally high or low ancestry frequencies in a given population, the ancestry, the correlation actually go up some as is shown on the lower triangle. So things that are most uh, different from the genome average are more consistent. If you look at the level of full chromosomes, you actually see less overall consistency. So here, correlations in average answer to the chromosome level between all 12 pairs of populations on the upper triangle. And you actually see some negative correlations that is indicated by the gray dots that are typically involved in two populations. Instead, you think about the variance in the answer to in chromosomes. In other words, how variable in answer to the long chromosome. We actually see greater consistency, higher correlations. So Chromosomes will show more variation in one population than two in others. Last, I want to think about any core ancestry blocks that might be fixed or nearly fixed across all populations, as these could be particularly important for, for adaptation and speciation. So I asked if there were any, and the answer is no, there are no ancestry blocks that are fixed or nearly fixed across all populations. There are, however, uh, numerous ancestry blocks that have very high frequency in many or most populations that, that uh, and do so more often than they by chance of this jump here. This either means that there's a couple different solutions to adaptation of the alpine that come up in different populations, or the things we're picking up here, the extreme ancestry blocks, actually aren't the things that are that important to the species. And that's it. <laughs>